In three, two, one. Hi, Jeffrey, and welcome to the show. Uh, once again, we are together on the future of branded content marketing and PR. It's one of the most popular podcasts on uh, on on the internet uh, for branding and marketing. And I'm Karnveer Mundre, and I do this show, uh, you know, from from India. Uh, so last week we talked a lot about how do we create your message and we talked about making it simple and making it easily understood and how to go about the whole process and I was, and a lot of people have been listening to it and hearing it. So this week you are going to tell us how to do a key component of that messaging which is differentiation. Yes. Fantastic and this is absolutely uh, for, first of all, Kanvir, thank you for having me back. I uh, loved talking to you last time. And we kind of deliberately left out last time or short-circuited last time one of what is literally my favorite topics, which is differentiation. And it's my, my favorite, one of my favorite topics in part because it's so commonly done wrong. And um, doing it wrong is so correctable. Um, differentiating different, differently, um, means competing with your real competition. And this is a very, very correctable issue that can really accelerate a startup business if you start to get it right. So thanks for having me back to talk about it. It's a pleasure. So, yeah. So differentiating different, what does that actually mean? As I mentioned, it means competing with your actual competition, which means you have to figure out who that is. But let's step back just for a minute for anybody that didn't um, attend the last podcast. Um, as, as we talked about last time, I advocate a method called the message matrix as a discipline structure for boiling down your value into really simple messages that sell. And that's based on the fact that people just don't have that much time and attention to give to us. And we have to use what we get from them really, really well. Um, so we talked last time about using a simple and consistent structure to boil down your value. And it just has three elements. It has the positioning statement, which is your one big existential sentence. It has your three key messages. And then it has the proof points that show you actually do those things. And that structure is the same every time. But what determines what actually goes into that structure? What it determines the content of that, for example, one vital positioning statement sentence? Uh, well, we're gonna, this is the session where we get into that. So first it's important to understand the format, um, which is your sentence of your positioning statement goes blank is the blank that blanks or to be more detailed name of your offering or company is the category that's the kind of thing you are whether you're a car or whether you're uh, you know business intelligence software that provides one big benefit or one big differentiator this is the thing you're hanging your whole hat on uh, for example um, back in 2004 we said oracle advanced procurement is the procurement software, there's the category, that dramatically cuts all your supply management costs. Now, is that a benefit or a differentiator? Well, the all gives it a little differentiation, but mainly that is a big benefit. Dramatically cut all your supply management costs. Now, the question is, how do we decide if that, is, if that should be a benefit or a differentiator? Uh, could you not have the sound at the back? This yeah, let me, let, me, let me ask my wife if, if we can cut that background noise and we'll back up and repeat. Yeah. Uh, honey, that's, that's killing the audio. Are you done? Oh, okay, great. All right, so I'll just back up to the beginning of this slide. So, you know, we talked about how the vital element of the message matrix is boiling your value down to one existential statement, one sentence, name of your company or offering is the category, the kind of thing you are, that provides one big benefit or one big differentiator. Uh, for example, back in 2004, we said Oracle Advanced Procurement, name of the product, is the procurement software category, the kind of thing we are, helps identify us, that dramatically cuts all supply management costs. Now that particular statement is more benefit than it is differentiator. 
how do we get to that decision? How do we decide whether to focus on a benefit or a big difference from other similar offerings? So here's how we get into the crucial area of what I call premature differentiation, the biggest pitfall when it comes to marketing your offering, because being different isn't always better. There's a right time and a right place to be differentiating from your competition. And it's critical that every startup understands when that time and place is. So here's a framework to help you understand it. The basic idea is you should differentiate from direct competition when the prospect already understands the category. They already understand the kind of thing you are. And they already know that you are that kind of thing. So you should differentiate when a prospect understands the category and when they know you're in the category. Now, let me give you some examples, good and bad, of how that can play out. So, Convair, I need you to help me with a role play here. So right now, you're going to be um, a farmer 120 years ago, and I'm going to be Henry Ford. And I'm showing you the first automobile that you have ever seen in your entire life. And here's my sales pitch. So, Carnvir, you should buy my Ford automobile because it has the most efficient carburetor of any automobile. It's way better than a Chevrolet. So what would your response to that be? Uh, you're muted. Sorry, I, th um, I, I said I, I would wonder what a car is and uh, you know, the carburetor comes very a lot uh, more down the line. I wouldn't know what you were talking about. Exactly. What's a carburetor? What's a car? Get out of my horse barn, right? You, you, would, you would not be interested in that pitch at all. This is what we refer to as premature differentiation. I am trying to explain to you why you want mine but you don't yet know enough to want any. You, don't, you, you can't want mine until you want one. So there is a strategy for me here. There is a sales pitch for me to make here, but it's not explaining how I'm better than a Chevy. So my new pitch might be something like, uh, Carnvir, I have this, this new thing. Um, I'll call it a horseless carriage because a hundred years ago, you already know what a, what a, a cart is, what, it, what a carriage is. It's a horseless carriage and it can help you get your milk to market 10 times faster. It never gets tired and it doesn't poop on the road. So I've given you a very different pitch now. I haven't differentiated from a direct competitor. Are you more interested now? Absolutely. In fact, it makes me think probably that's why they started with the term horsepower, because it was so much easier for people to to connect to that instead of calling it carburetor power or, or you know, Einstein power or something like that. Exactly. And the category, the category for automobile didn't necessarily start as automobile. It started as horseless carriage. So what, did, what does that category do? The main role of category is navigational. And so the idea of a category is that it should be either obvious or retroactively obvious. It should either, it, it should tie to something I already understand. So if I call it a horseless carriage, it might sound strange to name it for what it doesn't have, which is a horse. But by saying it's a horseless carriage, I already understand that a carriage is a method of transportation. And horseless, well, that sounds kind of odd, but yeah, tell me more, right? So yeah, uh, so what am I doing here? This is education. This is not differentiation, this is education. Now, you could look at it a different way. You could say, I am differentiating, but I'm not differentiating from another car. I'm differentiating not from what you would call a direct competitive alternative, but what Jeffrey Moore would call a market alternative, 
which is I'm differentiating from the way you're doing things today. And we can find examples of this. We don't have to go back 100 years to find examples of this. We can go back 20 or 30 um, to the early days of CRM, customer relationship management software, you know, now dominated by Salesforce, but established and long dominated by Siebel. And what did Siebel do? Siebel said, this is what customer relationship management is. And this is why it's beneficial. And this is why you don't want to track your customers in Excel. And by the way, we are it. We have it to sell. So whether I'm Henry Ford or whether I'm Siebel, if I explain to you the value of a category uh, and help establish that category, then it's just very convenient for both of us that I happen to be standing there with a Ford to sell you once you actually want a car. So that's education. So the critical mistake in messaging that people make is they differentiate when they should be educating. And I'm going to say that again because my coffee maker just went off and made a noise. Um, the, okay, I'm going to let it finish that noise. Okay, now it shut itself down. Okay, so, so the critical messaging mistake that people make is they differentiate when they should be educating. Or another way to say it is that they try to differentiate from a competitive alternative when what they should be doing is contrasting from a market alternative, AKA the way people are dealing with the problem today. So that's education. Now there is another phase you might find yourself in, consideration, and that is where the category is well-established. People already know what a car is, but they haven't heard of you. They don't have credibility about you. So in the United States, Hyundai came into the US car market for the first time, and everybody already knew what a car was, but they had no idea who Hyundai was. And so Hyundai's main um, task at that point was to get people to think about them at all in any capacity. So um, just let them know, we have a car, uh, you should stop off and look at our car on your way to the Toyota lot. And if they can get enough people to do that, then they can differentiate on something else like price and they'll sell some non-zero number of cars. And then gradually they become more established. Now, fast forward to the present day in the car market. Everybody knows who a car, what a car is, everyone pretty much knows who makes the cars. This is a differentiation market. Um, so cars may be 95 or 99% the same, but whether I'm differentiating on feature or prestige or image, um, if I'm a car maker, I focus on the 1% difference, right? Uh, Mercedes places ads that explain, that show one brake assembly and explain the unique safety features that they have. Other 99% of the car, very similar to every other car. Um, show me the difference. I don't need to hear the 99% again. But if I'm back in education, I need to hear that. And that is what I need to hear. And it's frankly all I need to hear. In order you know, it's, to interest it, it's interesting. Uh, your, feed, your, your chart is quite interesting in light of some uh, news which was recent. You know, I don't know if you've heard that, but Monica Lewinsky was, uh, w was considering a car. This is like three days ago. And mm -hmm. she tweeted that, should I, go, should I buy a Tesla or should I buy a Subaru? Mm -hmm. And uh, Elon Musk actually f somehow came across that tweet. And he tweeted back saying, let me give you a deal. You buy a, a Tesla. And if you don't like it, go buy a Subaru and I'll take it back. No questions asked. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that, that's, that, that, that tweet has been, has been doing the round. And I think that comes in like kind of second, you know, low vendor awareness. So probably Tesla, while it's well known, but people still don't know whether it is, you know, I mean, whether it will serve their purpose, whether, you know, it can... Uh, you know, be charged well enough. And, you know, there's still a little bit of doubt about electric cars that people have. Yeah. So and that's that, what probably uh, uh, Elon Musk was doing when he, when he told her that you just pick up, I mean, you buy a Tesla and if you, if you don't like it, you know, so she'll be more yeah, aware it, of it. It's, 
it, it's an interesting example because it spans a couple of these, right? So if, if, if Elon Musk had been tweeting as the head of Mercedes rather than the head of Tesla, then it absolutely would have been true that 99% of every car is similar. But electric cars are in a slightly different space. Um, they're moving from early adopter to early majority to complete mainstream. And there's different people are in different states. So um, there is more to be done. And um, one of the things you do when you're in considerations phase, which one could say that maybe electric cars are a little bit more in than, than regular cars, is you take measures to de-risk the purchase for somebody. So where you're a little different or where you're a little less known or a little less credible, you find ways to make up for that. For example, Hyundai did that. Um, initially, they just did it with price, but later they put a 10-year warranty on their cars when Toyota and Honda, very reliable cars, were putting a three-year warranty on their car. And they're saying, well, maybe you haven't heard of us. Maybe you're a little less confident of us but we are going to make up that gap. And what's interesting about that is you could call that differentiation, but I would call it de-risking, almost trying to reduce the difference between you and the known leader. So it's another way to look at it. So yeah, you, you, you've pulled an example of a well-known market where something is enough different that you might need to do something to close that gap. So interesting example. Okay, so, so if we have this idea that differentiation versus education um, needs to be marketed differently, it's really useful to have examples of what that looks like. And although we don't have time to drill into entire message matrices from each phase, we can at least look at the one sentence. So um, let's start with education. So in an education phase, um, 120 years ago, first automobile you've ever seen, a positioning statement might be something like this. Ford, which is the name of my brand, I still need that in there, is the horseless carriage category. And category right now is more important than brand. That outperforms animal-based transportation. Now, I'm not saying that Chevy doesn't outperform animal-based transportation. Uh, I'm just saying that we do. And in fact, probably all horseless carriages do. And at this phase, when I'm competing against the market alternative, the horse, then it's absolutely fine that what I'm promoting are generic benefits of the category. I'm not so much trying to make myself unique. I'm trying to educate you about the whole category and explain that that category is better than the way you're living your life today. So that is... a a good example of a, an education positioning statement. Now let's look at the more sort of Hyundai in the 80s kind of positioning statement or Oracle procurement in 2004. Oracle Advanced Procurement is the procurement software. Now, by now, procurement software is a well-known category. At that time, Ariba was a very dominant competitor in that particular space, and there were a couple of others. Um, so people that need to know what procurement software is already know what procurement software is. And now I'm gonna make a big claim and I'm gonna say it dramatically cuts all your supply management costs. I'm not saying Ariba doesn't, but I'm kind of saying we do more. And since we were an enterprise big suite vendor, there's a little emphasis on the all. So it's a credibility play with just a little touch of differentiation against the established competitors. It all is a coverage message. Now, let's move ahead to a well-established market where the, um, the company is the dominant competitor. So Roadmaster, uh, this was a company called Medio Group in the Netherlands, had this product of winter road weather solution. This is data predictions and software for agencies that need to put salt on the roads when it snows. This company was the leading competitor. So we just declared it. Roadmaster is the world's leading, that's, that is in fact the big differentiation claim, winter road weather solution. Now, we're just making that declaration and then we're gonna give the three points that prove that and defend against competitors and defend our premium pricing against competitors as being worthwhile and cost-effective. So if you're in this state, Congratulations. 
but most of your listeners are startups who aspire to that state. And so don't fake it. Because in this, this is a case where if you try to fake it, you won't make it. Uh, make sure that you actually are in this position before you make this kind of statement. Otherwise, work on the others. And so then we have to spend our last five minutes talking about how you get to that point. You get to that point by understanding where you are today and putting your message emphasis there. So here are a couple of questions that will help you. When you win, you know, when your technology wins a sale and gets implemented at a customer, what are you replacing? If you're replacing a direct competitor every single time, then you're probably in the differentiation phase. Your market is probably well understood. You're somehow being a little bit or a lot better and you're replacing a direct competitor. Good for you. You can do phase three differentiation messaging. If you are most commonly replacing a homegrown solution or an old existing way of doing things like a paper or a manual process, then most likely you are in the education phase. You are explaining to people why they should replace their horse. And in that case, you should lean your messaging on the benefits of the category, not on the 1% specifics of you versus your most direct competitor. Here's another way we talked about winning. It could also, it could also be a synergy or a, or, a, or a mix of the two. For instance, uh, some people may feel that the product that you have is not yet ready for them or it, it, is, it is slightly too advanced for them. So you may want to tell them that, you know, uh, for instance, that no, you, you should have this product right now, which will probably help you take you to the next level a lot faster or something like that, you know? Yeah, and, and, and that makes a lot of sense. And that leads us to our next criteria. We talked about when you win, what do you replace? When you lose, when you lose a sale, what do you lose to? If you lose to every time or most of the time to a very similar direct competitor, say another innovator that is in the same race with you, um, that is, you know, then you may need to focus on differentiation. If you lose to what I would call a blank stare, or I have no idea what you're talking about, I don't understand, or I'm not ready for this, um, that, again, is an indicator that you have work to do on the education side. For so, instance, you know, we, for instance, we yeah. do uh, public relations. And yes. a lot of times when we, uh, you know, a lot of, we do a lot of work for science, and uh, a lot of times when we talk to them, they say, oh, you know, we are like a year away from creating our product or launching our product, and then we'll talk mm -hmm. after that. But a lot of times uh, what public relations and communication says and the logic says is that you actually should compete or, or not compete. You should actually communicate before you create your product so that you learn mm -hmm. what you need to create. Uh, you know, yeah. like a, a Tesla doesn't start its marketing after they create the, the car. They've already right. uh, talked about the car so much and Apple already has talked about the phone uh, a lot. So that's, that's where advanced marketing we think comes in with, you know, which is something which many of our clients, they don't understand that you can actually, you know, start off before so you're not so when we are pitching we are not sometimes pitching to a direct competitor but also they do not understand that they need to start their communication it's it's good for them it's not just us trying to win a business but it's good for them to start their communication even before their product is ready it's absolutely true and in fact um, it's especially true if you're in an education market because you don't just have to explain your own existence, you have to explain the value of the entire space. And um, the need to get that feedback 
too, that feedback loop going. Uh, one of my clients, alphahq.com, is in the business of creating an agile research platform for rapid consumer feedback. So companies that are innovating, especially in spaces that are disrupted or, or self-disrupting, they really need that information um, as part of their product development process. So the communication has to start in order for them to start getting the feedback to develop the product that people actually want. You're right, nobody should develop and spend five years developing an electric car that nobody wants. Uh, Absolutely. So, yeah, it's really, really key. So to go back to the, the differentiation choice, if you're consistently losing to very similar direct in competitors, ones that are as innovative or almost as innovative as you, then we're talking about a differentiation focus. But if you're losing very often to people just taking no action or not understanding the value of the space at all, then you should be focusing on education. And um, here's an, a, a final way to think about it that's very connected to the first two, which is where's the money? Now, this is a redacted example from a client, so the specifics have been taken away. But um, this kind of example probably occurs in your listeners' startup spaces all of the time. Um, let's say that there is a market where you're trying, you and several other innovative competitors are trying to disrupt an old way of doing things. Now, chances are the people most on your radar are those direct competitors, right? The ones that look and sound the most like you. But in this market, redacted market example, all of those competitors together account for, including you, account for maybe 50 million of ARR a year. What that means is you could take all of their customers and still not get that big. 50 million sounds like a lot, but it's, you know, it, for a, a scaled SaaS business, it's not what you aspire to. You want to be the billion dollar unicorn. Now, on the other hand, um, let's say the agencies or the BPOs that are outsourcing the old way of doing things for your potential customers today might account for a billion in ARR. And the Luddites, the customers that are just using paper or an old process, not using any solution or any agency, might in this example account for another billion at ARR. So where's the money? Whose customers do you want? You don't so much want the customers of your fellow innovators. Yeah, that would be nice, but it's not where the money is. You and your fellow innovators should both be going after the zombies and the Luddites because that's where all of the money really is. And that kind of is the point that I want to leave you with. If you want to differentiate correctly, in a certain way, it's really simple. Differentiating correctly means competing with your real competition. So this is a Peloton. This is a group of bike racers in the Tour de France. Um, and if I ask you to look and say, who are they competing against? Your first impulse would be to say they're competing against each other. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. By the end of the race, yes, they're competing with each other. Who are they competing with right now? the headwinds and the rain. And that's why they're grouped a certain way. They're actually trading off. They're actually trading places as to who takes the point and pushes through the wind. They're gonna try to beat each other at the end, but right now they're all just trying to survive the race and they do that together. So if you're part of a peloton of innovative competitors, yes, you ultimately want to beat them, but in many situations, you and they have the same mission, which is to explain to people that this is a problem we're solving and that there is a better way to do it. That's education messaging. So go back, look at that three-phase diagram or um, you know, think about education, consideration, and, uh, and differentiation, and think about who is my real competitor right now? And where can I go to take the money? And if it's an entrenched old way of doing things more than it is your direct competition, focus on that, focus on education. So you differentiate different when you compete with who your real competition is right now. And that's really what I wanna leave you with. Wow, this is so interesting because I think that a lot of times uh, 
startups around the world they are uh, they don't know who the real competition is and they have to you know uh, e- even the startup ceos the, the startup entrepreneurs they are every day fighting so many fires uh, that they forget to they, they sometimes forget who their competition is and and uh, you know how to really differentiate or they just are on their own they're they're just on their own path they forget to they're so kind of surrounded by fires that they don't yes. know exactly uh, which fires to put out which will lead them to utopia you know they they're just like frantically waving their hands around it at everything exactly and, and and there's a difference between salience and importance right if 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 some direct competitor kicked your butt in one one to one competitive situation you might think they're your worst enemy but they may not be they absolutely may not be it may be the old way of doing things that you and they both need to educate people about so uh and so just to you know leave this with an offer to your startup listeners if you feel like you need help identifying where you are on this continuum please feel free to contact me i'm i'm developing a, a little quiz that will help you orient on that but um we also may just be able to you know tell them just set up a quick 15 minute call and i'd be happy to um kind of take in a little bit about your situation and tell you where i think your dot is on that continuum and therefore where you should focus your message matrix and for those who are uh, listening on audio uh, you can contact jeffrey at uh, jeffrey@messagemechanics.com that's j e w f r e y at m e s s a g e mechanics.com so that's where you can reach the superman of messaging <laughs> <laughs> well thank you and feel free to connect with me on linkedin as well so uh thank you very much i hope that this was helpful thank you jeffrey and it was wonderful speaking to you again i look forward to staying in touch great bye